Hi, Gene Montrostelli here, the editor of TappingQA.com. The video that you are about to watch is a conversation that was a part of this year's 24 Hours of Tapping. The 24 Hours of Tapping is a fundraiser for the amazing work that is done by the Peaceful Heart Network. The Peaceful Heart Network has brought tapping to migrants, refugees, prisoners, and the underprivileged in over 30 countries all over the world. As you watch this video, if you learn something, if you were touched by it, if you were inspired by it, the easiest way to say thank you is to support the work of the Peaceful Heart Network. To do that, all you need to do is go to 24HoursOfTapping.com slash support. And as you look in the description and the first comment down below, you will see a direct link to that. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Our next conversation is with Dawson Church. Dawson is an award-winning science writer with three best-selling books to his credit. The Genie in Your Genes was his first book to demonstrate the emotions drive gene expression, mind over matter, showing that the brain creates much of what we think as object reality, and Bliss Brain demonstrates the peak mental states rapidly remodeling the brain for happiness. The really amazing thing about this particular conversation is um, we're going to talk about the nine gamut point. And it's one of those things that for many of us who are old heads when it comes to tapping, we're taught about this years ago. And for new folks who've been introduced to tapping, they've actually missed a lot of training on this. We talked about the gamut point a couple of times already in the 24 hours. But now this is our opportunity to do a deep dive into that. Please, please, please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Dawson Church. One of the interesting things about transformation, and you know, you and I have been around this for a really long time, is how things kind of come in and out of fashion. And sometimes there is this game of telephone that happens when we are teaching things and it's passed from one person to another. And one of the things that we have seen is, you know, in the last 15 years, tapping has gone from tapping on points in the body and tapping on the hands and all sorts of eye movements. And there are a lot of my students who know tapping, but didn't know that there were finger points, didn't know that you could be doing eye movements and stuff like that. Um, and so as we were talking about getting ready to have our little conversation, you're mentioning the fact that we're starting to recognize that some of those things that were around originally that have been shed, there's actually some use and some value inside of those pieces. And so I thought it would be a great opportunity for us to kind of reintroduce some of that. And so what have you seen in the research in your own work with clients, with your students, that sort of stuff around these things that we have lost that might actually be useful? Yeah, and if you look at the history of EFT, so beginning with um, Roger Callahan and in the early 1980s, him developing thought field therapy and all of the techniques he introduced as part of TFT that are getting simplified over the years, uh, different alternate forms of it being put together. Finally, in 2008, 2009, we developed what's called clinical EFT, which mm -hmm. is the evidence form of e based form of EFT, which, which follows American As Psychological Association standards. And then all the research done of that form, clinical EFT, there are 48 techniques in clinical EFT, and the nine gamut and eye movements are really important. And we also have neuroscience tools to study that. So we now hook people up to an EEG and, or put them in an MRI and see what's going on in their brain when they do those parts of EFT that maybe aren't practiced much anymore. And Gene, the nine gamut is amazing. The nine gamut is a series of nine things you do, mostly with your eyes, while you're tapping on a point that Roger Callahan called the gamut point on the back of the hand over here on the triple warmer meridian. And so what we find, actually, I'll tell you what a story. One of the very first times I, I used the nine gamut was really early on, like 2003, 2004. I was working with a group of people and one of the men in this group had been abused as a child. His father had beaten him many times. And on his eighth birthday, his dad got mad because his kids, his friends were making noise in the house. And his father hit him so hard that he broke the boy's jaw. So now we have dozens of beatings. One of them caused a bone fracture. And I had him work on that. Often we use what we call in clinical EFT, the worst or the first, the first memory, or mm -hmm. the worst memory. And the worst of the first was that eighth birthday. And so I worked with him on that one specific event. Now, what was so interesting was that as he did the nine gamut eye movements, which again, tapping the, the gamut point and doing the eye movements, 
his numbers around the beating and his jaw being broken by his dad beating him dropped from a 10 to a zero. But what was so interesting was that his numbers dropped on all the other beatings as well. And mm. I suddenly realized, aha, we dealt with a specific event and we've also cleared a whole bunch of trauma around highly related events. And so that's one of the indications for the nine gamut when you have say 40 events, 50 events, rather than working on all of them to all of them individually, you work on all of them collectively with the eye movements. And we typically find that you collapse one, all the others in the sequence collapse. So we're bringing back these techniques now that neuroscience is showing and experience is showing are really effective. And so I think for those of us who are not the old heads who've been around forever, maybe it'd be a good idea for us to just kind of walk through what those nine things are real quick. So then as we continue our conversation, folks can have a sense of what's going on and can even be tapping along with us at different points as we're doing stuff. So what are what, what does it look like again? Yeah, so in fact, as I show you the nine gamut procedure, I invite you to think about something from the last couple of weeks that bothered you that maybe has echoes before then. So perhaps you were stuck in line somewhere, you had a long wait in line, but you may have had a wait in line many times before, and you may have a high level of triggering around that. Often there are small things that bother us being, say for example, being behind a driver that doesn't use his or her turn signals. Maybe a certain word your spouse uses or a certain phrase your teenager says really bothers you. So think about something that's bothered you in the last two weeks. Don't go back to your childhood. Make sure you pick an adult event, but think about something that maybe has more to it than just the immediate experience you've had in the last couple of weeks. Maybe there have been many times in your life, and I think standing in line, Gene, because I don't know about you, I I'm sure you're way more patient than I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, we live in modern times, and so I'm in a circumstance where the line is not as bad as it was 10 or 15 <laughs> years ago, because uh, I have right. a distraction machine in my pocket, but yes. Yeah, there we go. So. It, think about that thing, get the, that event, whatever it was, recent event, and then think about, about an event that, again, echoes many other events in your past, and then assess your emotional intensity, zero through 10. So when you're thinking about being stuck behind that driver, not using their turn signals, when you're thinking about um, dealing with your taxes, whatever it might be, you have this high level of intensity and it's recent and you've got a number and then score that from zero to 10 and please write that number down because we find people's numbers drop so quickly when they're doing the nine gamma technique, they suffer from what Roger Callahan called the apex effect. They don't even believe that their number was that high five minutes later. So I want you to have that number staring back at you from a piece of paper or from your screen. So think about something. In fact, you can get one of your own, just some pet peeve in the last yeah, couple I, of days. As you were doing that, I, I was thinking of something I saw online recently where it created a pang of personal, of professional jealousy from oh. an opportunity somebody else had. I too, like it, it was just like seeing a little Instagram post and boom, I'm at an eight just like that. Okay, that, that's exactly the kind of event to, to pick. So, um, and probably if you think about that pang, where's the pang in your body, by the way? So it's 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 like this ache in the middle of my chest of just kind of like there's a little rage and there's a little feeling small, like both of those things are existing. And rage might be a little strong, but there's a, a, a an anger, jealousy and a, oh, I'm kind of tiny inside of that. OK, so you've located your physical sensation. Mm -hmm. What's your number zero through ten? Eight. Eight. OK. And so everyone listening to Gene and I go ahead and do the same thing. Physical body location, get your number, write it down. Now we'll do the nine gamut. And you tap on the gamut point on the back here. Actually, let's just correct for psychological reversal first. So rub the sore spot over here, right below your collarbones. That's where Callahan originally had us correct the psychological reversal. So rub there. In fact, you can rub deep there. You can feel if there are any sore places there and really get in between those ribs and let go of anything that's maybe pulled there or stuck there. 
And it's, and it's funny as you say this, like it's already a six. Okay, good. Like, like I can like just, 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 just like clearing <laughs> reversal in this way. Like I can already feel it releasing. Yeah, good, wonderful. So initial bit of release, just clearing reversal, and that's always where we start round of EFT. Usually we use the side of hand point, and often we can, if we don't want to use that point or want to try an alternative, we'll use the source spot over here. So we'll 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 do that initially. Then we'll do just the nine gamut procedure. We'll skip the basic recipe. So back of hand, again, really focus on that event and that physical sensation. So in your case, it's that twinge, that pang in your chest. And, and just to be clear for folks tapping along with us, we're, we're between the bones, correct? It's like between like the extension of the pinky bone and the ring finger, we're in that little valley, correct? Yep, and usually with three or four fingers you tap there. Great. And again, notice your breath. Just notice the breath going in and out of your body. Now, close your eyes and open them. Look hard down to the left without moving your head. Move your eyes only hard down to the left. And think about that event and that body sensation. Look hard down to the right without moving your head. Again, you keep your head pointed ahead, but look hard down to your right. Focusing on that body sensation. Then move your eyes all the way around in a giant circle at the edge of your peripheral vision. And what helps to keep your eyes at the furthest extent of their travel is to imagine a giant clock in front of you. So you can start like at 12 o'clock, keeping your head steady, look up at 12 o'clock, up at the ceiling, now look at one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock. Hold the three o'clock for a few moments. Keep tapping, keep breathing. Think about the event while you look at three o'clock. Look at four o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock. Pause for a moment at six o'clock and feel that physical sensation. Move your eyes to seven o'clock, eight o'clock, nine o'clock, again, not moving your head, only your eyes, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, hold the three, think about the event, think about the physical sensation, think about your number, your triggering degree. Now go in the opposite direction. So you're at three, now go to two, to one, to 12, keeping your head steady, not moving your head, eyes only, at the very edge of your peripheral vision, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, now back the other direction, 9, 10, 11, 12. Relax your eyes, keep tapping, notice your breath. Think about the annoyance, think about that spot in your body. Now hum a few bars of any tune you like, just whatever tune is coming to mind. <laughs> <laughs> Count rapidly from one to five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Have a few bars of any tune you like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Take a breath and then relax your hands and just tune back into your body. See how triggered your body is as you think about the event again. And what is your number now? So what's yours, Gene? There's nothing. Like, I mean, and, 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 and there was, there was a moment even before we got to the end of all of that, where it was just like, oh yeah, like, like I was even like trying to, at that point, like trying to think of other instances of it. And it's just, yeah. it's, just, it's, it's it like, it's, it feels like kind of like this, 
nagging thing in the back of my head that doesn't have an emotional charge to it. Kind of like, it's like, oh, I got to do the dishes tonight, but there's not an emotional charge about having to do the dishes, but it's just something I have to tick off the box. It's like, so it's, there's a little of it there, but there's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a vapor of it. And so we um, still remember the events after tapping. We no longer have an emotional charge attached to them. One of the cool things too in my, my research is looking at the epigenetics of this. And they're little tiny molecules called microRNAs. And when we have anxiety, depression, stress, these literally adhere to our DNA strands. And mm -hmm. in one piece of research I did, a really advanced piece of research, we found as people tapped, their anxiety dropped, their depression dropped, their PTSD symptoms went down, and those little epigenetic markers associated with anxiety and depression popped off the genome. They literally mm. were affecting the, 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 their gene expression by, by tapping. So it's not just that you feel better emotionally. It's not just that your, your, your memory is there without the emotion. It's literally producing epigenetic change inside your body. And that's the magic of the nine gamut. And when you say epigenetic change, I'm like, I immediately start thinking of like Mark Wolin's research where we're like dealing with trauma from that is passed through the gene. So we're saying this anxiety is this anxiety that I've picked up earlier in my life that's connected to my genome, or is this anxiety disposition that is passed to me genetically in that particular layer? Is it both of those things? We don't know. Uh, and we don't know uh, when and why those markers were were initially attached to, to the DNA. So we can't necessarily trace it back to the originating event. Now, gotcha. experimentally in animal trials, we, we can do that, but right. these, these are human studies and we don't know, you know whether these were attached in childhood, did they appear only in, th these were, these were uh, combat veterans mostly from Vietnam. Gotcha. So did it yeah. happen in Vietnam? We, we don't know the origin. We just know that after tapping, after the nine gamut, they were gone. Yeah. So, so I have two, two like tactical questions on how we do this um, before we start talking about kind of what's going on with this. Um, number one, um, when I was originally taught this, it, it, the eye movements were less deliberate and were much swifter. So it was just kind of like a, a spin around a clock versus the kind of incremental chunks that we did there. Is one way more effective than the other? Was that a teaching technique to get people used to seeing those spots? Like, is there a difference between the speed that we're moving our eyes? That's a great question, Gene. And that's because research advances. We know things now we didn't know 25 years yep. ago. We didn't know things we didn't know 35 years ago when, when Roger Callahan came up with the nine gamma procedure. So uh, he came up with it clinically and observationally. We know now what, what works better. And we know from other research that people with trauma have trouble with peripheral vision not the central mm -hmm. vision, they can look at something right in front of them yeah. and that works just fine. What they cannot do is stabilize their eyes at the periphery of their vision. And this was noticed initially by an optician. He noticed that when he had Vietnam veterans with trauma, their eyes were fine in the center of their visual field. When they looked at the edge of the visual field, they fluttered like this and they could mm -hmm. not make the stop, it was involuntary. Once they've been cured, the fluttering stopped. So we know that this happens. We don't know why the brain processes inf information this way, but something about the edge of our peripheral field does this. It's hard to notice if you're fluttering when you're doing the eye movements fast. Gotcha. If yeah. you do them slowly, like we call that the clock technique. We've de developed the city of the universe, the clock technique, one, two, three, doing it slowly. Uh, you can tell more readily, most importantly, your practitioner no. So if you're doing a Zoom session with a certified clinically EFE practitioner, they are not doing the nine gamut. They are staring at you at the Zoom screen and making sure right. that you're hitting every, every part of the quadrant. What we typically find is people who are traumatized are going to skip one of the four quadrants. And I'll, I'll, I'll just lean forward here and show you what skipping looks like. Okay, so skipping. So my eyes are 12 o'clock now. Now I'm moving them around all the way at the edge of my visual field, now I'll skip one quadrant. See me skipping one quadrant, 
over and over again. So your trained EFT practitioner is looking very, very closely as you do this slowly and noticing where you're skipping, having you repeat that one quadrant often over and over and over again. And it's amazing to watch people who've been severely traumatized just suddenly shed layer after layer after layer and have a radical shift as a result of doing this. And as you're saying that, I, I'm thinking of a training that my friend DiLorenzo did um, uh, last year where she, she's, she works with EMDR as well. And she actually had this a little pointer that had a tiny little rubber ducky on the end of it <laughs> and was actually moving it around and having the person she was doing the demonstration with where they were holding their head and seeing the places that as she was moving it around where the eye would do a little waver or skip yes. in that particular way. So awesome. That, that, that's great to see that. So that, that that's useful. The second thing that I remember when I was taught this, that in addition to being here, I was instructed to also be touching or rubbing the collarbone point at the exact same time. And I have no idea if I that actually happened or if that's something that is conflated in my memory or there. But do you, does that resonate? Does that ring a bell with you? Or am I just making something up which is completely possible from my past experiences? Yeah, there are a lot of other tapping uh, techniques. And we, we, have, we, 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 we teach those as something called advanced energy therapies. So we have people gotcha. trained in clinical EFT. They learn the 48 clinical EFT techniques, which you can look up online. They're all in my book, the EFT manual. And so um, you can get all of those techniques, but they're all kinds of advanced techniques. For example, just the eye techniques all the way around here are great for psychological trauma, especially repeat trauma. We also train people to use this for pre-verbal trauma and womb trauma. So trauma that happens mm. before we're born, trauma that happens before we have language to express it. How do you deal with that? You do, do, deal with right. it non-verbally through eye movements and other, other techniques, but there are also a lot of other eye movements. And so we teach those as part of what's called advanced energy therapies. Gotcha. And that's part of our energy psychology certification, which is an advanced class. And there you learn things like figure eight eye movements, you learn uh, going from near to far, and all kinds of other uh, kinds gotcha. of eye movements beyond just the very simple circles taught in the nine gamut. Yeah. So, and, and, and as we're presenting this, like one of the, you know, just because we can, doesn't mean that we should. Um, I love having conversations about making sure that people are using things in a safe way. So there is me using it with someone else where when I'm using a tool with someone else, I have the ability to hold a safe space. If I'm doing things in a well and trauma informed way and making sure that everybody's safe and thinking about those things, it's a different thing when I'm tapping on my own. Is there Anything someone needs to be aware of, you know, when they're using a technique like this, if they're just doing some tapping on their own, they're not being supervised by a well-trained, well-formed practitioner, like where is, is there a line somewhere? Is there something we need to pay attention to? You know, I mean, like, you know, just because I know surgery works doesn't mean I should be the one that's taking <laughs> my own belly. You know, and so, and, and, and so, so like, so like, like, I think it's always really important for us, particularly as, as the, as, as this work matures and we're getting a chance to share it with more people to make sure that we're like, in a lot of ways, I think of like the first 15, 20 years of tapping kind of like civil war medicine, like, you know, where there are people who are dying in the field. Therefore, we're just trying to do things to be helpful for them and not knowing whether or not it works. And I think there's a there was a lot of just like, hey, go try it and see if this works in this particular way. And in hindsight, it's kind of like, oh, my gosh, that probably wasn't the safest way for us to be doing something or instructing people to do on their own. So is there any kind of caveats or things for us to be thinking about for someone who's just trying this on their own? Yeah, great question. And the nine gamut I find is safe when applied yourself to your own issues. But um, we prefer that if people are dealing with psychological trauma, if you know you've been traumatized, mm -hmm. you know you have PTSD, if you have, especially if you're working on childhood material, we strongly recommend you work with a practitioner or they're trained yeah. to guide you through that. If you have overwhelming emotion, if you have emotional flooding, like I worked with a woman in one of my classes and I, I, I sometimes, Gene, I, I, I pick somebody I think has a minor issue. So this particular woman had, had a really 
small irritation. And I mentioned earlier being triggered by people who don't use their turn signals, drivers, and that was her, her issue. She was triggered by other yeah. drivers who didn't use their turn signals. I thought, I'll pick her as a demonstration subject. We'll have the demonstration over in five minutes. It'll go so smoothly. Everyone will be so impressed. <laughs> yeah. Pride cometh before a fall, as the Bible says. Yeah. So it turned out she had massive childhood trauma, it was around her dad. And we wanted, uh, wanted very quickly with her being emotionally flooded. She got so flooded she couldn't speak. And then she couldn't even tap. She just sat there staring at me, floods of tears coming down her, her cheeks and just immobilized by emotional flooding. And so we. We, I did the nine gamut. I tapped repeatedly. I spoke for her. And after about 10 minutes or so, she began to tap again. Then she began to speak, and we moved through it, and we were able to process some, some of this stuff verbally. But yeah, initially, if you're dealing with in big childhood things, we recommend you work with a practitioner. The second time we recommend you work with a practitioner is when you have repeat patterns. In my men's group, I had one young man who came to me. He was like, 28 years old, he said, Dawson, I'm having a problem with my girlfriend. Is it her or is it me? And I thought, well, that's a great question. I thought for a few minutes, I said, you know, if you've had this problem for the last three or four or five relationships, it's yeah. probably you. If you've never had this problem before, it may well be her, but look within anyway. So is it you or is it the other person? And so when you're dealing with things that are you, it's usually way more effective to go and work with a practitioner who specializes in the area. Weight loss is one example. If you go work with one of our trained clinical EFT practitioners who's a weight loss specialist, you get go hit the, hit the nail on the head, go right to the target right away. Blundering around on your own, trying to tap on this and that, trying to find the issue, it's going to take you a long time. Like if, if you want you know, a good attorney, if you want a good surgeon, if you want a good any professional, go find somebody who knows the territory, They'll be your guide. They'll get you to your destination fast. You can wander around yourself trying to figure it out, and you may eventually do, do that. But for those big issues, relationship sabotage, money sabotage, any form of professional issue, family issues you aren't succeeding at, go work with somebody who knows the territory. They'll guide you there way faster than you can all by yourself. But for, for minor issues, by all means, try out on everything, as the, the saying goes. The, Stress is an element of all kinds of problems, and you reduce your stress immediately by trying it on all of the issues that bother you, but then go with, work with a professional on those longstanding issues. And it's funny you say that. I actually have a rule in my own life. If I have a task on my to-do list that gets moved three times on three different <laughs> days where I'm not doing something, and I specialize helping people with self-sabotage, like that, that's the place I would call my area of expertise. But if I see that happens three times on my calendar or I move things along, if it gets moved the third time, the next task I put on my to-do list is sign up for a session with my practitioner uh, where I'm yes. seeing if it's persistently showing up in my own life. And so that's just the governor I've created. So it's it's not, is this persistent? Is it not? It's measurable. Oh, it's happened three times. Great. Once, once is an anomaly, twice is a coincidence, three times is a pattern. Okay, it's now time to do something else about this. Yeah, so what Gene and I are saying to you here is we have practitioners. I go see a practitioner. I worked with yeah. Margaret Lynch a while back on an issue, which I thought I saw every angle on. It took Margaret five minutes to figure out an angle I totally hadn't seen. So yeah. we have practitioners. It's not like you get good at EFT and you tap a lot and release a lot of stuff, which you do initially. I mean, you're just dumping all kinds of old yep. old stuff initially and still be a blind spots. We need help. So uh, yeah. it might be therapy. It might be EFT. Make sure you support yourself with trained professionals. Yeah, we are notoriously bad eyewitnesses to our own experience. Yes, so, so, so we now have a sense of how this works. We're seeing what's going on. What kind of what what other than like seeing things releasing at an epigenetic level? What are some of the other changes that you have been able to measure when using something like the nine gamut process? The issue I mentioned earlier of preverbal trauma and prenatal trauma is a big one. 
One of the images I've never forgotten is a sonogram that Bruce Lipton showed at a presentation I went to a long, long time ago. And it was a sonogram of a baby in the womb. So you see this little fetus and it's being measured by the sonogram and it's moving around in the amniotic fluid. And then the mother and father start fighting and they're raising their voices at each other. And you see the fetus start to jump. It's like it's being jabbed by a needle. I mean, the, this mm -hmm. fetus is in obvious distress in the womb. And that was many of us. The cortisol, the mother's cortisol crosses the placental barrier. And many of us are literally learning biochemically to be stressed while we're in the womb. So how do you deal with that? You can't say to that client who's been stressed by prenatal trauma, whose parents were in chaos while they were in the womb, give me a specific event to tap on because they don't remember. Yeah. Neither does the person who was injured at the age of six months, 12 months, 24 months. For the first two years of life, those pre-verbal years, the limbic system, the emotional brain is the fastest growing region of the brain. And if insults, if trauma is laid out at that level, neurologically, it's notoriously hard in psychiatry yeah. to treat those people who had early life abuse. Adverse childhood experiences, again, result in, in ad adult disease, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, a whole slew of adult diseases show up in people with adverse childhood experiences, especially early childhood ones. And so the way we work with these when we're training people in clinical EFT is we have them work at the level of the body because maybe you don't remember consciously but your body, in the words of Bessel van der Kolk's best-selling medical book, your body keeps the score. Rick Hansen, who wrote the book, Buddha's Brain, said to me, he said to me on several interviews I'd done with him, he said, you know, Dawson, I had a perfect childhood, white picket fence, my brother was really nice to me, I don't remember any traumatic events, but I wound up being a college student who was hypervigilant and anxious. Why is that? Well, mm -hmm. the chances are he has events he doesn't remember. He may have buried prenatal or preverbal trauma. He can't access. So how do you get there? How do you get there for a Rick, a Rick Hansen? How do you go to those places? How do you work with that, that baby who's jumping around in the womb when the, the parents are arguing? And what you do is you do it non-verbally, and that's the nine gamut. The nine gamut is not a verbal technique. We're not saying, even though this happened, I deeply and completely accept myself. We're ignoring verbal for the most part. We're, we're certainly remembering it, but we're tuning into the body. The body keeps the score. Where do you feel it in your body? Is it in your chest, your heart, your forehead, your shoulders? Let's feel it in the body and then do the nine gamut. And when you have access to the body that way, and you then do the nine gamut, we find that that trauma is released. That person may never remember what happened in the womb or in the first few years of life, but suddenly their body feels different and you will watch them, Gene, when they're telling you their life story after that, you'll watch them going from rigid, sitting there with tight shoulders, shallow breathing, heart pounding, very limited range of motion. They'll tell you the same story and they're moving around in their chair. They have their full range of motion in their neck and shoulders. They now have very regained mobility in their body. The body, we've changed the score the body keeps. And that's what the nine gamut can do. And I think what you're touching on is really important because, you know, when we are, when we're learning tapping, we're often told be as specific as possible and I think people misinterpret that to, I have to be specific in order for something to be successful. And sometimes as specific as possible is this feeling in the middle of my chest. And that is as specific as I can be in that particular moment. You know, oftentimes like the analogy I love using is like looking into the backyard on a, on a foggy morning and in the beginning, it's just fog. And as the sun rises and mist starts to melt away, like there's an outline of a tree and an outline of a shed. And all of a sudden <laughs> we can see a door and all of a sudden we can see the leaves and, and it's slowly coming in. And so at 6 a.m. as specific as possible is there's mist. Where at 1030 as specific as possible is I can tell you the lock on the gate is rusty. And giving ourselves permission to know that specific as possible 
doesn't have to be the specific story and memory and all of that sort of stuff, because sometimes we don't have access to it because our subconscious mind is keeping us safe from it. And sometimes it's the stuff that you're talking about. It's preverbal, it's in utero, it's those sorts of things. Or like, you know, Mark Wallen, who I mentioned earlier, it could be something that is epigenetically present from a previous generation that has shown up. I'm afraid of water, but I've never had a bad incidence there. Well, it could have been when my dad was 13 and he was the one that got pushed into the water and I got passed on to me. And so having a tool like this where, because as a client or as someone tapping on their own, it can feel like, oh, I'm failing at this because I can't remember something. I don't have, I need to go to this thing. And this is, this is so liberating to go, great, start with what you got in a really simple way. There are no words. It's really, really simple to do. Yes. And we have people get fluent with their body's language after a while. Mm -hmm. And your body is very specific. In fact, we'll have people describe that feeling like what I might have done if we we're doing a full session, Gene, is I might have, might have said, tune into that feeling in your body. What color is it? Yeah. What shape is it? What do its outlines look like? Are there any other colors? Is it moving? Is it stationary? And you'll be amazed. You'll ask clients these questions and they will give you extremely Absolutely. specific details of that that physical sensation. So yeah. we do, that isn't a conscious memory, it's a body memory. Our body's keeping the score and it is a wealth of information to us. And after a while, we start to learn to hear it. People in the Western world often are very disconnected with their bodies and they aren't used to tuning into their bodies and listening to its wisdom, especially when its wisdom is in the form of pain. We have pain, we want to rush out and get a painkiller, get a prescription and make the, kill the messenger. And if you kill the messenger, then the body has to send you a bigger and louder trumpet to get your attention. Yeah. So it's powerful to start to tune into your body. Then you feel a little pain, you feel a little sensation. I wake up in the morning, I feel this little bit of discomfort here. I love you, body. I listen to you, body. I accept what you're doing. I then do things, maybe EFT, maybe movement, maybe yoga, maybe dance, maybe a walk in nature, something to release that. But I am in dialogue with my body, especially when it's screaming with, to me in pain. I'm listening to it. I'm receiving that message. I'm acting on that. I'm respecting it. And then the body doesn't have to yell very loudly to you to get your attention. And then you're in a dialogue and you're living in your body. And it's so wonderful to actually live fully in your body, not be afraid of your body, be in dialogue with your body, and then that becomes part of your reality picture moving forward. So the body is this um, huge underappreciated thing in Western society, in Western psychology, but the body does keep the score. The body is where our most basic memories live. And we now have all these body healing techniques, grounding, EMDR and EFT, with the eye movements and the tapping and other forms of physical stimulation. We know that yoga therapy, Qigong therapy, all these physical somatic ways of being are effective. Nature is epigenetic. You don't have to go into the forest and spend a week there. Just walk to the nearest tree, give it a hug. <laughs> and I, there's, there's actually the there's actually nature. there's a tree there's a tree in my neighborhood every time i walk by it a tree grows in brooklyn every time i drop by this tree in my neighborhood i have to do a 10 breath zazen breathing exercise every single time it's my buddy but it's it's like it's this little reminder of me of going great you have access to this little oxygen machine that is here here stop do these 10 breaths in this very particular way. And so like, it's, it's, yeah, it's a routine for me. I'm not hugging it, but boy, am I spending some time with it every time I walk by it. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing I think, yeah. And the other thing we're saying tuning into the body, like one of the things I've noticed, like, is I was like reconnecting with all this recently is when I tune into my body, I tune into my upper body. And for me, it's been this really conscious thing of recognizing it's not just down to here, but it's beyond the bend as well as I'm sitting here, that it's like the whole body. And so for me, when I start thinking of my body, it's like, okay, great. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to feel my toes on the floor. So I'm going to the farthest extension. So I'm paying attention to the whole thing, not just here or not just here. Like I live here or I live here and giving myself permission to go the whole way is, is a useful reminder for myself. 
Yeah. And then, of course, you get in the habit of doing that, and that becomes part of your reality. So we're, we have yep. our minds, we have our emotions, we have our bodies. We live as full human beings expressing us, ourselves through all of those, loving all of them and inhabiting them fully. And so we have this lifetime, we have this time here on Earth to express the fullness of our potential and doing that in our, through our bodies as well as our minds and hearts is so powerful. And there are times when just that movement is going to shift you in a way in which the biggest insight can't possibly do. So EFP is a awesome. body-centered form of, of intervention, and that's why it's so successful. Awesome. Well, Dawson, thank you for re-reminding of us this lost gem that many of us heard years and years and years ago, and we just lost it because it felt complicated and overdoing it. But it, it's good to be reminded of it, but also to recognize the unique context and the value of it. So thanks for sharing all of that. Oh, it's been a joy, Gene. Thanks so much for what you're offering here. And I know that as people use and apply these techniques, they're going to feel and find rapid shifts happening in their lives. I'm so grateful to you for what you're offering. If you found this interview inspiring, I would encourage you to support the Peaceful Heart Network by going to 24hoursoftapping.com slash support or clicking the link in the description. And you will see on the screen right now a playlist to all of the interviews from this year's and last year's 24 Hours of Tapping. I hope you enjoy those as well.